Hello, everyone, and welcome to another Premier Pundits podcast. We're recording early this week. It's Wednesday, and it is our fan team special. The €75,000 jackpot, the monster weekend ahead of game week 28. My name is Ben Dinry, and of course, I am joined by the stat man, the money man, Mr. Jason McKenna. I wasn't a money man last week. I only won like a small, little, teeny, tiny prize. I went away with 78 points last game week. So, you know, any money is better than no money. But, um, yeah, one of my teams actually did kind of all right. But there was a lot of shocks last week. And, you know, you're asking how I am. I'm still in shock at some of the results, some of the things that happened, the data... The form, the fixtures did not kind of point to any of those things happening, but they did. This is football, and this is what you kind of come to expect. It's it's kind of why it is so hard with these team choices. And what I would say is this game week was especially difficult. You know, looking at them, there's not a lot of kind of clear-cut fixtures where you think that team's a favourite, that one is. There's a lot of teams that are probably performing very close together, uh, there might be not a lot of goals, the kind of thin edge of the sword. And even ones like Man City and Fulham, which on paper seem like dead cert for Man City, they're going to destroy Fulham. But then you look at the underlying data of Fulham over the last few game weeks, and they've done pretty well. So even those kind of things that seem a dead cert don't seem a dead cert when you kind of drill down. But yeah, I'm excited yeah. for this. You're excited yeah, to see... Go on, Ben. I mean, before we get into all of this, I, you know, you've mentioned because we've come off the back of two quite difficult game weeks in terms of results and in terms of performances maybe going against the data. Is this a trend that you've maybe seen from previous seasons where we're coming into, you know, the business part where teams and are maybe they've got different goals, different objectives? Some teams still have something to play for, while others can maybe afford to take the foot off the gas. And is that a trend that you've ever noticed across previous seasons and something that we maybe need to be aware of? I think this season especially has been incredibly anonymous, uh, anomalous in terms of data and kind of outputs. At the start of the season, we saw teams like Everton scoring a bag load of goals and then a huge regression uh, Aston Villa have kind of seen a, a huge kind of fall off since game week 19 because of the COVID situation. I think a lot of things that are being thrown at teams this season with kind of injuries, fixtures, but also the fact of COVID looming there alike. I don't know if it's affecting teams psychologically, but in terms of the data and the outputs, there is a lot of strange things happening. There's also the loss of the home an away effect in teams so that's almost been nullified each game is almost played now as as neutral we've seen a, a huge kind of downturn in home teams winning so that kind of effect there so I think this season itself is an, a strange outlier but on your second point of this uh, effect of teams to play for yeah there's there's a huge effect in kind of data when teams have something to play for especially coming towards the business end of the season they score more and concede less and I kind of like going towards the end of the season and almost seeing the games where both teams aren't great anyway they don't have a lot to play for they're kind of secure they're like 15th 16th and so you see actually kind of high scoring games. I remember one of the big ones that I had a laugh about um, on uh, my podcast like a few years ago was the Crystal Palace versus Bournemouth game. And at the time we kind of did a fun thing where we tout the highest scoring game of the weekend. And that one was ridiculously filled with goals because both teams were safe. Both teams had some fairly good attacking players, but terrible defences. And so, you know, nature just did its thing <laughs> and it, it was a good one so I think we will see this coming towards the end of the season we might see a little bit more shock at the top of the table as well Man City have already had that shock kind of result against Man United but as they focus on going on four fronts there might be more rotation more risk of 
slightly lesser output than we'd expect from them. And mid and lower table, I think there'll be some high scoring games with tired legs as well. Psychologically, this has been a huge draining season. And when you look at the numbers as well, there's not been that big gap from last season to this season with pre-season. So I think there's going to be a lot of weird results going forward. And I hope that the data can guide me. But in these instances, they don't. I mean, from your perspective, Ben, surely this has been one of the kind of most strange data sets that you've seen for a while in terms of injuries as well. Yeah, I mean, we started off the season um, significant increase in incidents across the board. It almost seemed as if it was coming more into line in and around Christmas, early in the new year. Um, and I think maybe COVID contributed to that. You know, we've seen the absence of Newcastle, Aston Villa, I think Manchester City, maybe Everton, Fulham, all miss games in and around that Christmas period. You know, historically, when you have those congested games, that's when you're picking up your soft tissue and, and muscle injuries. Um, you know, so the, the data wise, it, it looked really good from that point. But we're talking about an accumulation of fatigue as we progress. And as we approach February, we again, we've seen a sharp rise in it, uh, a spike in the number of injuries. And again, you know, we're seeing a lot of injuries coming through. Uh, and in fact, I mean, I'm just running the data today as, as we talk. So um, hopefully that will be on Sky Sports this week or maybe over the weekend uh, if they decide to use it or not. So there you go. That is breaking news. Uh, hot off the press. We are recording on Wednesday. So it may be on, um, you know, we may have a little bit of a slot on Sky Sports. Fingers crossed. And just for people listening there, Ben and I obviously both work for Premier Injuries. Ben is my boss there. Uh, very good <laughs> boss, though, indeed. But in terms of it, we are at the forefront of Premier information in terms of injuries. So if you want to give us a like, subscribe and share on our channel as well, please do so. But I think just to end this kind of preamble before we get into my team, I think one of the most fascinating things that I've seen this season is one of what I will call the best worst teams ever with Brighton. <laughs> I mean, it's it's kind of sad in one aspect that this is probably one of the most unlucky teams ever. But then there's a lot of discussion points about, right, Brighton are producing amazing XG, but they're not scoring. They're producing amazing, amazing XG conceded, but they're still conceding. So there's kind of two questions here of uh, Brighton, are the players bad? Or is it the manager not managing them correctly? And so there's going to be a lot of discussions around that, maybe post-season as well, because yes, Brighton are producing fantastic XG, but are the goal-scoring opportunities kind of good enough for the play style and the players that they have? So if you were kind of producing a lot of shots in the box for maybe somebody like Andy Carroll, is that the right thing? He'd probably be better to head the ball in or, or something like that with a more physical approach. Whereas a smaller kind of player like Aguero is kind of good for those opportunities. So maybe Brighton are producing good playing football, but it's not the right style for the players that they do have. But let's move it on to my fan team. And hopefully I am playing the right style to kind of get the points this game week. And as always with this, Ben doesn't know my team. This is all going to be a shock for him as it comes up on screen. And I just wonder how many of my players that you have. So just initially here, Ben, you can kind of see who my team is with Johnston and etc. the rest. How many of your players have you got in your fan team that I've got in mine? Uh, at a quick glance, um, looks like I have three. There were four that we had matched up um, and we made a last minute switch up. Uh, and I'll explain the rationale behind that after you sort of go through yours. But we've set up in the same way, um, same formation, which is a little bit unusual for me because I, I tend to, I like to go with five at the back and, and really pack out that defence with some, you know, some budget defenders in there. Um, and I've opted for a slight change of tact this week. So, yeah, I mean, look, we will discuss all of that. Um, 
you know, my initial thoughts on your team, there's a few surprises in there. I mean, I don't know if you expected me to have um, more players, uh, you know, similar to yours in this squad. Because, yeah, I, I'm quite surprised at one or two of yours. And uh, maybe players that I was once warm on in the last couple of weeks, I'm starting to cool. So, um, <laughs> yeah, this will be an interesting one. I think so. I think so. Because as I said there, it's a difficult game week. But starting between the sticks, I've gone with Johnson again. Uh, I actually think this is more on the opposition that West Brom are playing. But also, I do see a little bit of upturn in the abilities of West Brom. I think maybe that Sam Allardyce effect is finally coming into play. So this fixture... Arguably, it might be the one that I actually have most confidence in. Crystal Palace going forward are rock bottom of the attacking data in the last seven game weeks. The side have six goals in total in seven game weeks. And that is an overperformance. And so, for me, that's encouraging for West Brom players. And since game week 21... Crystal Palace have been bottom for XG, bottom for shots in the box, bottom for chances created and bottom for big chances created. They're not doing much in the attack. The only kind of point, the chink in the armour, if you will, is Zaha will be back. And I think he has been good this season, but obviously it will take him time to get back to full speed. Over the course of the season, he individually has been good, but the whole team has been poor the whole season. And so, yes, he, he might be back, but I'm thinking there that it's going to be a difficult one. And it goes for the same reasons Johnson with Bartley as well. So I'll just cover those two and then hand over to you, Ben. But also Crystal Palace have had problems defending set pieces this season. They have the third worst goals conceded from them. Bartley is one of the focal points for these movements with West Brom and that's actually reflected with the highest XGI of all West Brom defensive class players in fan team over the last four game weeks he's been getting those headers he's been the the point of uh, where they kind of aim those set pieces over the last four game weeks so that is uh, an interesting one for me and I, I word that specifically as well because in FPL uh, I think Ainsley Maitland-Niles is classed as a defender but in fan team he is a midfielder and he has a higher xgi but he is a midfielder in this gameplay so with those two it is a double up there might be a stack kind of deficit there but i think that realistically crystal palace can uh, won't be kind of giving too much problems to west brom but do you think that zaha is going to have a big impact once he's back ben that was my concern because my initial thoughts when I put me, me draft team down f for this week, uh, I went for Johnson and, and Bartley again for the third week running. And it wasn't until I went through the team and, you know, we see Zaha come off the bench. He'll now have another full week of training in his legs. And I think maybe not just the necessary his individual performance. Yes, he will be a little bit rusty. He may lack that little bit of sharpness. But he will lift those players around him. Um, you know, they've suffered a little bit of a downturn in recent times. This is, you know, a, a six-pointer, you know, as far as they're concerned. Ben Teke has looked bright. Um, and you know, on occasions, I think he's got two and four now. Um, you know, consolation goal last week, he grabbed the, the winner, I think it was down at, at Brighton for that last gasp volley. Uh, against the runner play, I just see Palace maybe nicking a goal, and that that's that's me worry. I'm happy to take a punt on one baggy defender, um, but with this not being as confident on them keeping a clean sheet, I don't want to be hit with the double whammy of of losing two clean sheets and um, you know having a, a hit off the stack as well. So um, yeah, Johnson went. And uh, I kept Bartley in, and I actually opted for uh, Kasper Schmeichel in goal, um, just based again, you know, the same same conversations that we have with regards to Palace in front of goal, maybe you know Sheffield United, and it, to me it doesn't matter who they seem to play, whether it's McGoldrick, McBurney, Brewster, 
Sharp offers a little bit of threat, but you know, yeah, I'd be happy to back against Sheffield United scoring every week, um, and that's why I went for Schmeichel. This is the interesting one because my next defensive pick is actually a Leicester City one, and I did look, I did consider maybe somebody with an aerial threat because. Sheffield United have one of the worst records for defending set pieces this season, like Crystal Palace. But Leicester aren't very good at scoring set pieces. They only have four for the season. There was that time at the start of the season when they hadn't scored for ages. And I think also the loss of Madison means that they'll struggle to get good deliveries to those players that might cause problems. The the other thing for me with Leicester is their defence data hasn't been great over the last few game weeks. I think those big losses to their side have impacted them psychologically, but also on the pitch, it affects their play style. And so their XG conceded is actually bottom half of the table. The reason why I went with Pereira is because he has that attacking ability. But then this one's a difficult one for me to justify a little bit because I've been let down by his attacking threat since he's come back in game week 21, three shots in the box. But of all the Leicester defenders, he has the highest XGI in that period. So I think Sheffield United is in my consideration here that they're so poor going forward, uh, bottom or near the bottom of a lot of those attacking metrics alongside old Crystal Palace that we just talked about there. But there is that worry that there is that leakiness there that they don't have that ability to maybe see out games like they were doing when they had that full squad so he is one um and i do this you know the the kind of temptation that we laughed about last week there are a lot of other ones that i'm considering so he's not a hundred percent now but there is that attacking ability there from Pereira. i mean do the underlying numbers worry you a little bit with leicester as well or does the Sheffield United kind of almost transcend that? They're just so bad at going forward that it doesn't really matter to you. Um, yeah, I mean, Leicester, Johnny Evans is due back this weekend. So for the first time in a long time, uh, you know, Brendan Rodgers could line up with it. Maybe he looked at it a 3 1 4 2 with Johnny Evans, Fafana, and Soyunchu, and then your two wide men with Castagna. Um, Pereira, he might put out on, on the right-hand side of, of the wing. So, you know, if I was going to plumb for anybody in that Leicester back line, it would be Pereira, you know. If he's attacking, um, you know, metrics and data, odd, great, well, anything is a, is a bonus because, you know, first and foremost, he's in there to get a clean sheet. And, yeah, look, Sheffield United will score at some point. Um, inevitably, it could be McGoldrick. If he seems to sort of be the only one that's maybe popping up with it with the odd vital goal, but I, I'm happy to to go against Sheffield United with a with a Leicester defender this weekend. Fairly confident in that one. Yeah, it's it's one that I do have the confidence because of Sheffield United. There's just that leakiness that worries me a little bit, but I think I'm sticking with that one because the next one up is Luca Digne, and I think Everton. Their team data hasn't been great, but they do look a little bit better going forward over the last six game weeks. And that is kind of where Digne kind of comes in. Richarlison, DCL are kind of getting back to their good uh, abilities. And so those ball deliveries will hopefully be met with a head or a shot into the back of the net. But even though the team have kept three clean sheets in the last six game weeks. They actually have the second worst XG conceded in the last six, second most big chances conceded, second most shots in the box conceded. So the data isn't there. Burnley have also been all right in attack over the last few game weeks. So there is a little bit of worry there. But the Burnley players don't have that ability to kind of see off their chances. So their XG is kind of all right, but then they're not scoring the goals that they're they're kind of creating. So that's the only kind of positive thing there. They've got 8.32 XG over the last six and only scored seven. So they don't put everything away. I do like the fact that Pickford isn't being picked week in, week out. Now that 
Ancelotti has said that maybe Olsen will be starting. That actually fills me with more confidence if I do see him there. So there's kind of this discussion in my brain again that Digne looks good. You know, people see it's Burnley, they don't score a lot. It's Everton and they've done all right over the last six game weeks. But then you drill in deeper and maybe they've ridden their luck a little bit as well. So this this again, two of the, the back line there are not 100% certain on. And this is the wonderful thing about fan team is if I don't have this certainty, I can make a second team and take those weak links out that I'm not too sure about I can kind of protect myself protect my money in one sense that I can kind of go I'll go somewhere else so that's the positive thing about this and this is why I do my kind of you can go with this one other player or these two other players just to give you that mindset of there is more than just one way of playing this game so what are your thoughts and feelings on Everton and Luca Digne am I being a little bit too pessimistic there uh, Dini is one of the players we've actually matched up. Um, <laughs> and I do have my reservations with regards to Evan. I don't think the underlying data is great. They haven't been too good, in, in all honesty. Um, Ancelotti's tweaked the formation slightly. Richarlison, a little bit more of a free role attacking. They have had a few injuries. I mean, you did touch upon the um, the Jordan Pickford isn't guaranteed near down. We've, I think Robin Olsen's missed at least the last two or three games and there's no guarantees he will be back. James Rodriguez, he's been out with a, with a calf problem. Alan is just coming off a, a back of a long-term injury. Seamus Coleman um, could be included in the starting eleven this weekend, but that might result in, a, a, a again, another change in formation. So there's a lot going on there at Everton and I think that that could be affecting that fluidity, that um, ability just to sort of settle quickly in games but again I'm looking at this from the opposition perspective and Burnley struggle as well in, in front of goal um, you know we've seen Chris Wood coming back is obviously a big boost but maybe he isn't uh, you know 100% in terms of where he would like to be in his sharpness uh, Matai Vidra is getting a nod over uh, J Rodriguez at the moment who's carrying a little bit of a knock on his knee, but again, if you're relying on somebody like Vidra, then you know I'm happy to take my chances in that Everton backline. And Luca Dina, you know, gives you that potential moving up the pitch. Yeah, it, there's a lot of things to consider with it, and this is why I like to contextualize a lot of the things that I do talk about because there are positives and negatives for this one, and I'm just hoping that Everton can kind of see this one out with the kind of backstory that there is a few things going on, you know, as she said there, Rodriguez isn't fit. Is Olsen going to be between the sticks? Is Pickford even going to be there? So it's a fair discussion point, but hopefully the quality at the back of Everton kind of see this out because their defensive back line is quite good. It's just, I don't trust the goalkeeper. That is the, the main problem there. And then the final one in the defensive back line, is Cancelo. I don't think you need to kind of explain too many reasons why. Man City, amazing defensive data. He himself has great ability to kind of get involved with shots, creating chances. So he's got high XGI over the last six game weeks. He's somebody that you kind of in there without explanation. But he is quite high priced. We did see Man City kind of let in two against Manchester United. So there is that worry at the back of my mind. But I think the fact that Fulham, yes, they've been playing well, but they are continually kind of underperforming goal-scoring data. They don't have a great goal scorer. Lookman has done great bits, and I like watching him play, but I think they won't have enough for, um, for, for scoring against Man City this game week, basically. So Cancelo, I don't think I need to open too much on, on the data and everything. I think people know about that. So... Uh, I don't know if you kind of contend with that, Ben, but if not, we can just go into the other two defenders that I'm considering. I mean, the only the, the quick point that I would make about Cancelo um, and is that we're recording just before the Manchester City and Southampton game midweek. We've got the Champions League again next week, and you know 
Pep will rotate. I mean, the good thing about fan team is we have that safety net in place. So if Cancelo, you know, because he's such a highly, you know, he's a premium defender, he will be subbed in by whoever comes in to take his place. Uh, so yeah, I mean that would that would be the only thing that would that would move put me off. But again, we, we've seen City just goals against Column just you know creeping up in, in in recent weeks. And the outlet, there's a lot of money in, involved in in that City backline. And I'm thinking, for me, uh, I pro- I'll probably take a punt elsewhere. Um, and given the fact that you know Fulham are fighting, you know for their Top flight status. It wouldn't surprise me if they did get a, a you know, just nick a goal. Um, I still see the city win, maybe two one, three one. But um, yeah, look, I think uh, Fulham are more than capable of, of of getting a goal. So that just a little bit of a, a concern, and why I didn't personally go for any city defensive assets. Yeah, six goals conceded in the last six game weeks for Manchester City. So there is a little bit of a downturn there. And in terms of the safety net thing, that was big in my thinking of maybe Cancelo might not play because of Champions League, because of midweek fixtures. So that is a huge point there, Ben, that it kind of protects you a little bit. The two others that I am considering, first one, Lewis Dunk, I think this game... Between Brighton and Southampton, first of all, we've kind of discussed this before. Brighton have a good attacking and sorry defensive underlying data, but they're just not matching it. But they're playing a team who they've just lost Danny Ings, uh, faltering attack at times, not great data there. The two teams also let in sloppy goals, so I think this is a problem in the thinking. But I can see that one as being like a not not boring affair because. Both teams, uh, through huge stretches of this season, I mean, Southampton, I'd say, arguably are the better attack, especially with the personnel and the finishing abilities. But they've struggled. And Brighton, as we know, are just constantly underperforming their data and everything. So this one looks like, to me, a naught naught, And maybe that one might be better to put in, maybe for the likes of Cancelo or maybe Digne or, or Pereira, you know, the ones that... Not 100% on, but there is that just feeling in the back of my mind. I put in a Brighton defender over the last few game weeks into my fan team and they've failed every time. And the story is that obviously Brighton do play good football, good data there, but they're just not matching it. And so I'm coming to the consideration that I can't trust in them. And so that is kind of in my mindset there. But the Southampton game does look good. I mean, what are your thoughts and feelings on that one, Ben? Of course, Derby. Always difficult to predict. You know, bragging rights down there. Um, I think it's a big. I think it's a big call. Again, we might get a, a better barometer of how maybe Southampton will line up or play this weekend when when they play against City. You know, we, we know Danny Ings is out. Um, she Adams got his first goal, uh, I think, of the year. Um, last time out when he came on as sub, Ralph Hassan is hoping that you know he's looking for the catch-up effect. Nothing, nothing, and then it all comes. So he, you know he's looking for big things from him. Uh, and I mean, I don't want to preempt your attacking assets, but I've actually went with Nathan Teller, um, who is a budget midfield option at six point three, and the reason I did. Um, he's been playing up front in that advanced role. And Hassel Houghton said his uh, he's metrics, his data for that last game uh, were off the charts. He said he was absolutely superb, both in his, um, you know, his creativity, but those high intensity runs. And Hassel Houghton is, is impressed by the young lad. He's coming off the back of a fairly serious knee injury. Um, which held him back a little bit. So I think he feels he's got something to prove. And um, and yeah, look, I, I think as a midfield option and, and fan team, uh, it's 6.3 million in a game which, you know, uh, Southampton have got a real, you know, a good realistic chance of, of taking something from that. I, I'm prepared to take a punt on, on Nathan Teller and, and not so much on Brighton, um, you know, given the fact that, yeah, we've been burnt um, historically by their poor performances or 
you know, lack of clean sheets. It'd be interesting because obviously Danny Ings is away. It'd be nice to see if Teller was on penalties. Then you could say Penn and Teller making a magic pick there. But uh, <laughs> I don't think that is the situation because James Ward-Prowse would be the one to kind of step up to the line. But just a nice play on words That's a shame. Yeah. What a shame. It we is already a- we'll have the, uh, the headlines today. Penn and Teller. I see it up there in, in the lights. Somebody else needs to buy him just so that they can have that. The next one that I am considering in defence is Reguillon. I think Arsenal's attack recently has been really poor. Bottom half of the table data. Also factoring into my opinion, Mourinho knows how to play against Arsenal. But there is the fact that this is a North London derby. It is a heated affair. I mean, heads can kind of be turned, can switch off in those heated moments of raising emotions. And it's a hard one to call, but I just think that Tottenham are the better side going into this fixture. They do have a little bit of better form. I could see this one being seen out as Mourinho kind of just shutting shop. They get a goal or two and then seeing it as a 2-0. I really don't expect Arsenal to score. And this is a sad thing to say as an Arsenal fan, but... We've just not been good enough recently. The thing is, is obviously Arsenal have been good defensively recently, so this could be a 0-0 as well. But even if it is a 0-0, that does mean that Reguillon gets a clean sheet. But he's been good this season in creating things for Kane, who's in marvellous form at the moment. So Reguillon actually looks fairly appealing to me this game week with the poorness of Arsenal's attack and the fact that we know how Mourinho just gets into the Arsenal mindset. Yeah, I mean, both teams involved in Europa League action on Thursday night can potentially skew things maybe with any last-minute injuries. I think Arsenal playing Olympiacos, Tottenham, Dinamo, Zagreb, they can afford to not go really, really strong and involve some of those fringe players. Uh, Tottenham have looked decent the last few game weeks. Um, Gareth Bale, uh, you know, in decent form to, to go along with Harry Kane. And yeah, I do like Revion. Would I plum for uh, Arsenal or Tottenham defender in this North London derby? Again, it's not for me. I just think it's too much of a risky punt. We've seen last weekend uh, with the Manchester derby, you know, it just takes either a moment of brilliance or a moment of madness. Uh, and, you know, that's it. It's a clean sheet gone. And I, I like the attacking options from maybe both teams, uh, you know, and I prefer something maybe a little bit higher up the pitch as opposed to sticking anybody in from defence. The interesting thing for me is that Tottenham, three clean sheets in their last six, Arsenal, naught. So it, it, you know, embellishes the appeal of the attacking assets. But to me as well, I think the Tottenham defence is just a little bit organised and got some better personnel. So, those those two there are going to go to the line. I'm more settled going up the pitch. So let's have a look at who I've got in the midfield. Kevin De Bruyne, that game that we've mentioned there against Fulham, it's going to be a difficult one because Fulham have kept six clean sheets in their last eight. Fantastic defensive and attacking data. It does worry me, but he is the central part of a Man City attack that has up to gear apart from that poor result against Manchester United. He rarely misses matches, but if he does, the fan team system protects me. He's going to be involved. He's going to be feeding whoever is attacking in that game. So I do like uh, having that little bit of coverage there because Man City, obviously, and and Fulham Fulham have done well, but this is Man City who, on their day, can just dismantle anybody. They can score four, five, six. I don't know if it'll be that many, but De Bruyne would be involved with most of those chances there. He's going to be on the dead ball situations. So even in those difficult kind of moments where you think coming late into the game, there might be a loss of concentration. There might be a nice ball into the box and Diaz and Stones get their head onto it. So he has that high ceiling opportunity to be involved in so many opportunities with the best attack in the Premier League. I think... For me, I have to have some sort of inclusion there because the ability of Man City to go big 
every game week is just there and it's so appealing to me. But you you don't have him in your team there because you said, well, I think from the three that you've kind of pointed out there, it was Digne, uh Bartley, and I'm guessing it's not Kevin De Bruyne. Why isn't he in your team? I just don't think Kevin has... Um, he's back to his best. I think the you know, last couple of games, he's we've seen a few misplaced passes. Just, um, look, he sets the bar so high. So we're probably nitpicking. We're probably just, you know, so not used to seeing, um, you know, maybe Kevin not at his best, that when these little mistakes are creeping into his game, it's it's almost amplified. And it becomes more of a talking point. Um, look, what you said there, it, the, the rationale behind that selection is solid and sound. In comparison, you know, the price point, 13.9 million for me is a that's a big chunk of change for a game which I, I think will be pretty tight. Like I say, I can I can see Fulham scoring and it wouldn't surprise me if if uh, City edged it by just one, two one, and for fourteen million, um, you know, I'm not that convinced by Kevin De Bruyne. Um, so that's the reason I went against him. I mean, it, it, yeah, I mean historically, you know, these players aren't bad for long, but just if it's thirteen point nine million, is a little bit too rich. If it had some form, um, you know, then yes. But to justify that price tag, there, there just isn't enough for me. Would you say, though, and this is something that I've definitely considered, is that loss against Man United, obviously they're playing Southampton tonight, but that will be looming large in their mindset. They'll want to put that out of their mind. With the Champions League as well, they'll want to put in a good performance. And maybe that might push Kevin De Bruyne give him a kick up the backside and push him a little bit further than usual because, you know, the, the good thing about Pep is in those moments of hardship, in the, in those moments of difficulty, he kind of almost b- b- blooms and brings out the best. We saw early on in the season the team had a really poor start and he explains in interviews that he went back to basics. He kind of said, we're not playing the way that I'd want to. We're not doing the things that I like the team to do. And kind of seeing that Man United performance, I do agree that De Bruyne wasn't great. I mean, even his data isn't brilliant, but we know how brilliant he can be. And so Pep, the whole team, will want to come and, first of all, give a demolition of Southampton, but they'll want to do the same to Fulham to spur them on in this Champions League that's remained elusive to them. Of course, good players. We want to put out good performances. We want to bounce back. Again, I've come down to the fact that you know we've seen Kevin coming back off a off a muscle injury. Um, it's back to back double game weeks, and it's a Champions League. Could we see De Bruyne rested this weekend? Um, we know how City perform without him. We've seen how Ilka Gundogan performs without Kevin De Bruyne and his team. His, does his role almost regress back to a, you know a more holding player without? Uh, you know, when Kevin's back in that team. So I don't think Pep's afraid to make those big decisions. And with one eye on that Champions League, again, yeah, yeah, you've got your safety net. But, you know, you're still talking about, um, I think it'll probably be the most expensive player in the game this week. And yeah, look, there's too many red flags for me. That's the top and bottom of it. Let's move it then on to the next player in my midfield. And actually, I've got a double up of the same game, but from two different teams. The first being Mr. Mo Salah. I think Liverpool have been attacking recently and underperforming for once. You know, the last few seasons, there's always been this focus on Liverpool have a certain amount of XG, but they're overperforming. Is this sustainable? Well, they're underperforming recently. And... The worry for me is obviously kind of similar to this thing with Kevin De Bruyne. Their focus seems to be 
on the Champions League. But the appeal to me is that they play such a poor Wolves defence that have been incredibly lucky recently. Three sh- clean sheets in the last six. People think that they've shored up, but then they sit in the bottom half of the table for XG conceded. Second worst for box in the shots in the box conceded, which Salah absolutely loves and peppers goals when he has the opportunity. And over the course of the season, only eight clean sheets in total. They underperform their data. Their personnel aren't great, especially the goalkeeper, Patricio. So that one is actually quite an appealing game to me. It's just figuring out who's going to start. The thing with Salah is he's the most expensive Liverpool attacker. But I think whoever's kind of attacking in that game hopefully gets a good performance out there, whether it be Salah, Mane, or maybe even you know Yota, who's come back into the side. I think any of them can do bits against Wolves. The data is kind of almost there for me defensively that Wolves are so poor. And the side surely have to start matching that attacking data soon, at least matching it, not even going back to their, their dizzying heights of of hugely going 20-30% over XG. Just matching it, taking those opportunities that they used to. But the look on your face, Ben, is somebody that is like, no, this guy's talking absolute BS. What, what do you think? Too rich for me. 12 million, Mo Salah. Again, it's an emotive pick based on on dreams and past performances. You know, we look at <laughs> you know we look at Liverpool in the last month. Uh, lost at home to Brighton. They scored one against Manchester City. Got beat four one. They got beat off Leicester three one. Lost to Everton. Um, yes, they beat Sheffield United two 0 But then they got beat off Chelsea to nil. Uh, got beat off Fulham, granted there were wholesale changes. It's almost as if Jurgen Klopp has thrown in the towel, not only on the title, but almost that top four finish and Champions League. It's, it's like, let's go out and win the Champions League um, or nothing. And, and that's how it seems and it, and it feels, particularly after that lineup last weekend. And, and while I wholeheartedly agree, on their day, on form, Liverpool can bang and are more than capable of producing a five-star performance. At 12 million, Salah is just a little bit too expensive for me. You know, I've opted for, uh, you mentioned him, Diego Yota. Not only is he coming back off a, you know, a reasonable injury, but he's also lining up against his former club. And there's a little bit of an incentive there, you know, to raise your performance and, you know, maybe eke that extra five to ten percent uh, out of those performances. So I went for Yota. Just he's a little bit cheaper, um, and yeah, I totally agree that you know Wolves aren't great. Very very lucky last weekend in the Black Country derby. On, on paper, it looks like a good result, and it looks like a hard fought game at nils each. But they should have been two nil down. You know, in that first ten to fifteen minutes with Ollie Watkins and. Um, was it not Konza? Courtney House? Uh, was it that oh, Konza who hit the bar? And um, you know, from maybe five, six yards out. So very fortunate. And yeah, I'm not convinced by Wolves this season at all. But looking at his individual data, Salah. Obviously, the team haven't been doing too well. But two goals in the last six, 17 shots, 13 of those in the box, 3.37 xG. So he's underperformed as well, and four. XGI, which is one of the best in the league over the last six. Only Fernandez, Rafina, Gundogan, Sterling, Kane, and Diagne have performed better over that period. With Salah, I think it's kind of a, a, a when, not if, he will start scoring again. And I feel like this is a good opportunity. It's just that little worry of will he play? Because I do agree with you that the focus is on the Champions League. But just in my mind, it's, it's not the, the kind of historical thing. It, it just seems logic to me that you can't keep producing that data for somebody of that high quality. If it's somebody like Ollie Watkins, who isn't brilliant at putting the opportunities away, if it's somebody like Bamford, who you know is championship slash lower half of the table, but this is a world-class player who should be putting these opportunities away, has before, he doesn't pass these off often 
uh, is is my feeling on that one. But then, I mean, go on, Ben. What I mean, I, I, I tell you what, as well, it is there's a little bit of a media narrative out there that Salah um, looks a little bit disinterested. He's maybe he's referenced as being a fairly lazy player. Uh, but this might be a stat on you, Jason. I mean, you may or may not be aware of it. But in terms of across Europe, certainly across all of the main leagues, no player in any of those leagues has um, pressed more in the attacking third than Mo Salah. Um, so, you know, he's still got that belief, that intensity about his game. Um, yeah, he's maybe just not being rewarded, hopefully, as... Um, you know, maybe the underlying stats suggest he should be. Yeah, I mean, earlier on in the season, people kind of said that Mo Salah is performing poorly and this and that. But up until a point, he was scoring more goals than he did do in his record-breaking season. He was doing great. It was the, the team that were kind of not good around him. He himself was doing fine. And I can just kind of see that with the Wolves' defence. It's an opportunity, but then... He didn't do it against Brighton. He didn't do it against Burnley. Um, th- there is that worry in my head, but I just feel that it's it's that if, uh, sorry, it's that when that he's going to do it. And I think when is this weekend against Wolves? But somebody from Wolves that I've, I've actually got in. I'm just, I'm interjecting here. Gia, Go on. Because we've just had the team news announced for the Manchester City Southampton game live, so sorry to interrupt. And it's good news, bad news. Um, Cancelo's actually on the bench this evening. So that's a good indicator that you know he will be involved this weekend. We have also see uh, Raheem Sterling named on the bench um, and John Stones. So those are the three sort of high-profile absences from the starting eleven. Laporte comes in. Fernandinho starts ahead of Rodrigo. Um, and yeah, it's pretty much as you were. The false nine. So there's no Gabriel Jesus. And once again, we see Sergio Aguero on the bench. So he's not getting much of an opportunity to build minutes. Uh, and Pep Guardiola, you know, this week come out, he said, look, I'm not going to just play Sergio Aguero because it's Sergio Aguero. It needs to be the right time and he needs to earn place in the team um, and I mean if you would like to see with me the, the Southampton lineup, let's see if there's any uh, interesting um, bits and pieces there because Nathan like I say Nathan Teller was the one that I was going for um, he is benched so again we talked about Ralph Hassan who managing minutes with him being a young player coming off the back of a long term injury I like that in the fact that Teller you know Providing um, Saints don't get a great result tonight at the Etihad. But one of the other big breaking news from down there is Alex McCarthy returns in goal, which I'm very surprised at. Um, I don't really think that Fraser Forster has done a lot wrong. Um, but we see Alex McCarthy back in the um, back in the side. And also Walker Peters drops down to the bench. Um, that's probably linked to the fact that he's just come back from injury and not want to play three games in a week. But there you go, hot off the press. And Sorry, uh, no, no, hot, hot into breaking my heart there because Raheem Sterling was not only my captain this game week; he was my triple captain in FPL. I mean, it was a yeah. <laughs> Jason. It's almost part of me, right? That that I'm glad. I am glad <laughs> because at what point? Do you then hold your hands up and just say, look, enough's enough, my friend. You have been burnt so many times. It's it's unreal. The flame of Raz. Is. The flame of Raz. He, he just, I don't know. I, I like him. I think Raheem Sterling's a fantastic player, but he's he's done me absolutely disgustingly dirty this week with triple captaincy and basically no returns. But then last game week, the triple captaincy on... Uh, Man City players didn't work either, so uh, it's just a terrible, terrible one. Let's let's move it on to fan team where I can, you know, at least be a bit positive because I've done quite well in that over the last few game weeks. Neto is the weird one, the Wolves player that I've got in there. Now, what I look at is the fact that Liverpool have an equally poor defensive record as Wolves over the last few game week, 
um, kind of looking at that underlying data. Liverpool have performed really poorly, bottom half of the table stuff, letting lots of opportunities in, and Neto spearheads that attack. What I would also say is that the poor performing forward lines of Brighton, Burnley and Fulham a little bit earlier on in the season who have struggled to put away chances, who I would say are not as good at going forward as Wolves, have all beaten Liverpool, have all scored. So it's a bit like me backing Lookman last week. I do think that Wolves will score this game week and the likelihood in my mind is that Neto will be involved in that goal because that that's just him in the team. He's he's so integral to that attack. So, yeah, for, for me, I think it's an opportunity to jump on the fact that I think Liverpool will concede at least one in this game. Uh, it could be a high-scoring game. It could be one of those games where you kind of think Liverpool don't have much to play for. Wolves, what are they playing for? This might be one of those games that we talked about a bit earlier with there being high scoring and lots of goals. I mean, what are your thoughts and feelings on Neto Wolves or do you think that this one's a little bit too out there, too differential even for the dinnery? I do like Neto. I own him in other platforms. Uh, exciting prospect. Looked great. Just not convinced he can carry that Wolves team by himself. Uh, William Jose in attack. Maybe, you know, he ain't pulling up any trees. Um He's taking a little bit of sight. Silva done absolutely squat. Uh, Adam Atriori, you know, earned rave reviews. We're talking about a player here who has returned no assists and no goals this season. And are we 28, 28 games in and he has squat? Um, so, yeah, look, I cannot see Wolves. I mean, it's, I tell you how bad it's getting. Connor Cody had to come on the score sheet. And now and he's venturing forward now. I think he scored his first goal uh, in two game weeks ago, and then he hit the inside of the post last game week. And Sias should have scored. So, you know, you're relying on that defensive back lane to get Wolves goals. Um, so, yeah, look, Neto's great shout, but I just think he's, he's, he's trying too hard to, to maybe carry that Wolves attack and maybe to the detriment of his performances. So let's move on to the other ones that I'm considering. Maybe you might advise me to move to them. The first of which is Hyung Min Sun. And I think although Arsenal have been defensively good, I can see him getting involvement. I think the Arsenal defence has had strong moments, but the Tottenham attack will be too good for them this game week. Kane, Sun and Bale have all been in great form. And like you said a little bit earlier, the Europa League commitments of both teams kind of neutralises any kind of advantage there. So I can see that one. And the second one is Bruno Fernandes against West Ham. He's missed the consistent. He might get a penalty. But then with that one, I'm more reticent because the defensive data of West Ham puts me off a little bit. I think that will be a tight run affair as well. Maybe similar to the other side of Manchester with Man City against Fulham. So... With those two, would you kind of point me in the direction of one of them instead of a, a Salah or a Neto? I did look at Bruno uh, just for the fact that, you know, he's a guy that just keeps on producing. And when the chips are down, when everybody wrote him off in the derby, um, I think his price point was he may have been sub nine million uh, in last week's Fanti, which is unheard of. And of course, within a matter of Seconds, you know, was it maybe 70 or 80 seconds, whatever it was? Um, you know, he rewarded those who kept the faith, and yeah, there'll be there was that, you know, well, quite well, it was only a penalty, but you know, he still delivered. And it'll be interesting to see how West Ham cope without Jess Lingard, who has been, you know, a great January uh, loan sign, and obviously, he can't line up against his parent club now. That won't affect that that back line too much, but it just, you know, it it, you know, it just changes things up ever so slightly in attack, and it may just cause a little bit of unbalance. And again, it may take a twenty minutes, uh, twenty five minutes for for West Ham to settle into a slightly new formation or for new players coming in, and that you know may just allow United to get off to a quick start. 
So those are the ones that I'm considering as kind of different to the team. Let's move it on to my forward line, the last three in my team, and then the last consider one that I have as well. So the first one is Dianye from West Brom. I think his personal data is fairly good, and the ability on set pieces, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, with Carl Bartley is there for him to kind of maybe get a header and beat that Crystal Palace defence at the moment. What is amazing to me, though, is over the last six game weeks, he is top for all players in the Premier League for XGI. And in terms of the games, if you've been watching the West Brom games, he's been really unlucky not to get more goal contributions, whether that be goals or assists. And he's got a pretty damn good XG of 4.63 over that time period of six game weeks as well. Fantastic stuff from him. One of the top performing players in terms of underlying data. This may be the Brighton effect where they're just not good enough to see them off. But at the moment, at his price point and looking at the fixture there, I'm willing to take that punt because I can score him. I see him scoring in this game against Crystal Palace. Their defence isn't very good in poor form at the moment. Maybe they might score the other end, like you're saying, Ben, but... Their own back line is just a tragedy waiting to happen. And looking at it in terms of personnel, one of the things that we kind of talked about on our own podcast, Ben, but Geiter, one of the best goalkeepers in the Premier League last season, 7.4 XG prevented this season, minus eight goals, uh, 8.9. So basically nine goals XG prevented, one of the worst, in fact, the worst in the Premier League for XG prevented. Coupled with this regression in his save percentage, gone down by 4.5%. Third worst save percentage in the Premier League. And Crystal Palace have gone down from 26.3% clean sheet ratio to 21.4%. And looking at it as well, 1.2 goals conceded per 90 last season. That's gone up by quite a fair bit to 1.68. So all the things pointing to me that somebody who has been on a good run of form in terms of data. West Brom a little bit buoyant in terms of getting more forward, attacking a little bit more. Sam Allardyce playing a little bit more on the front foot as we kind of saw in the Man United game as well recently. I think that Dianne has a good opportunity here to actually match something that he's been doing for a little bit while here. But have you put the faith in Dianne in your team? Unfortunately not, and I think... It may be the first game week that I've actually um, went against Dianye. Um, That's very odd. <laughs> uh, yeah, and he's been he's a, he's been a favourite of mine across all formats. I just something doesn't sit well with this Crystal Palace fixture for me when their backs are against the wall and everybody expects them to you know get a good lick in. I don't know. I think the return of, of Wilfred Zaha just lifts the place. And I'm again, I'm not convinced that, that the Baggies are going to get more than one goal. And put me faith in Dianne. Yeah. 7.2 million does appeal, but look, the way I've, I've selected my team, I have, to, you know, I've, I've got options there in terms of cash so I can afford to, you know, go big. And that's why I really overlooked this week. So let's move it on to somebody that I think has a great opportunity this week. As I said, their Arsenal have had a good defence, but Harry Kane is on fantastic form. He lives for the North London derby. I mean, his historical data I don't really pay too much attention to, apart from when it comes to Harry Kane and playing against Arsenal. He He just loves it. I think there's that whole story of being rejected by the club, which fuels this bit in his heart that just releases this amazing amount of anger and energy whenever he plays against Arsenal. His own personal data has been great since he's come back. Five goals in the last six game weeks, XGI 5.35, XG of 3.92, 17 shots in the box. He's looking back to, to some of his best playing abilities and coupled with that, the Tottenham attack over the last few game weeks have scored a lot of goals. I think he's great. And then you look at something like expected points, one of the metrics from something like FF Hub, and he's up there as the kind of prime target for this game week that people, the the 
data that they have is showing that he is the prime target that people should have in their team. So for me, there's just a lot of things, form, fixtures, data, all pointing to Harry Kane as a great pick this game week. Do, do you agree on that one, Ben? 100%. No need to even discuss Sir Harry is in the team <laughs> and Sir Harry has the armband. So, Ooh. yeah. I think he, he's going to have my armband as well. I think he's he's a great pick for this game week. The final one, and this one might be more controversial, we have talked about the Leicester-Sheffield United game, and there's one man at the heart of that attack. He leads it. It's Jamie Vardy. There's a lot of but-ifs with him, though. He's not scored a lot over the last 10 game weeks. I think it's just one goal in that time. Leicester are without Barnes. They're without Madison. They're not looking great going forward, if some buts and maybes all around them. But again, with the kind of expected points, he's looking good there. But the other thing is the poor defence of Sheffield United. Vardy can punish people, and this is the type of game that he should be looking to punish Sheffield United. So I'm going with... This is not backed actually much by data. This is probably one of the only choices this game week that is not backed by data. This is kind of almost a gut feeling one that Vardy should go big against Sheffield United. I'm maybe going with more of your methodology, a Ben gut pick. I don't know if you like that though. Do you like that I'm going with a Ben gut gut pick? That that makes me feel a little bit uneasy. But what I would say (laughs) in in your defence of going for somebody like Vardy which won't be reflected in the in the stats and in the data. Um, am I right in saying that Jamie Vardy is a Sheffield Wednesday supporter? It sounds right. I know he's from that area. So I'm sure he's a big Wednesday supporter. So there's a lot of talk. Obviously, you'll get one over the old enemy. And do you know what? If Leicester get three points here and he was to get the goal, then, you know, if they're not already down, you know, that of you know, that probably resigns them to championship second tier football next season. So, you know, there's a little bit of extra incentive there for Jamie Vardy to snap out of this, you know, this drought, this downturn in performances. Uh, and who better to do it against than, you know, your local rivals? I mean, there is a little bit of data to Point to Jamie Vardy. First of all, he's just exceptionally good at finishing opportunities. Uh, of his 19 shots over the last six game weeks, 18 inside the box, 2.87 xg, 2.95 xgi, and one goal. So again, somebody who usually overperforms by quite a lot, underperforming. This is maybe one of those games that can turn it on its head. The final one that I want to bring attention to before we head to a close and talk about our head-to-head, Ben, because I did, I don't want to rub it in, but I did have a victory again last week. Uh, <laughs> but Richarlison... You remember what it was? It was, um, it was Fulham to score against Liverpool. I said uh, Liverpool would, it, would not keep a clean sheet. In, see, in that with a good crop line up and those amount of changes and the defence he went with. So, uh, you know, I'm going to peel that one. I'm going to appeal. <laughs> need you two educators to come in and, and check that out because there was a rabbit off. There was something happening with that one. <laughs> a bit of VAR, mate, or uh, head-to-head AR. Something that it needs to be investigated, some deep corruption levels there. But before we get on to our head-to-head discussions, for this week, Richarlison, he's on the kind of radar just a little bit because he's got good data over the last few game weeks. He, he's looking back to you know, what we expect from him. He is a good player. Uh, four goals, 15 shots in the box, fairly good XG and XGI. Um, the Everton team, not great data as we've kind of discussed, but he's looking good and there's an opportunity there to exploit a Burnley back line that isn't great at the moment it has been a little bit sloppy a bit too many mistakes for me and my liking so I don't know what your feelings on maybe Richarlison he is a bit more of a punt but with 11 xg conceded over the last six Burnley haven't been great either only two clean sheets in that time 
do you feel that maybe this is the time for Rich Arlison to to kind of shine a little bit? This is the time because Rich Arlison is in my team. So he's in that front line along with Sahari and Diogo Yota. So um I fully believe in him. I think that just that freedom that he's been allowed in this slightly tweaked attack and roll by Carlo Ancelotti. Uh, I can see him linking up with Dina this weekend and maybe, yeah, I can, I can see a good result against this this Burnley team. Um, getting a couple of goals, maybe two, three goals for Everton. At least I think that, yeah, I think they'll give them a bit of a hiding, to be honest. So that ends the player discussions and we move on to the final thing that we do each week just for a bit of fun I don't think anybody or anything is on the line apart from maybe pride or something like that but we do our head to head so we decide on one team one player something that we think is going to happen this game week uh, and then the person does the opposite so last game week just to remind people I said that Fulham would score against Liverpool Ben said that they would would, uh, Liverpool would keep a clean sheet and so I am 3-1 in the lead in the head-to-head league at the moment. So let's go into our picks then and I think one of our biggest heated discussions this game week, wasn't it Ben, is the Wolves-Liverpool thing. Maybe I'm a little bit too keen on some of the Wolves or Liverpool kind of players because I think poor defences with attacks that are, are kind of all right. They do have good players in them. Uh, well, Liverpool have world-class players. Let's let's not beat around the bush there. But Wolves still have some good players in there. I'm thinking that both teams will score uh, at least one goal. I think it will be something, you know, Wolves at least get one, Liverpool get at least one. What are your thoughts and feelings on that one? What is your going to be your prediction in that game? Well, of course, it will depend on which team Jurgen Klopp decides to to put out there this week. Um, but from what I've seen from Wolves, um, yeah, I'm happy to go against that. And I think a team will win to nil. Probably Liverpool, maybe two nil against my mm. vote this week. Big shout indeed. So that wraps it up for our fan team discussions this game week 28. Big one. A difficult one and I hope that the kind of data, the insights that we've given here are useful for you. So make sure to like, share and subscribe to Fan Team and get involved because it is a monster game week this one. €75,000. I mean, you don't want to be missing out on the ability to win all that money. I'm not sure what I'd do with splashing the cash there, but it's it's an amazing thing to get involved in and great fun indeed. So just for now, I'm going to wish you the best of luck. Hand over to Ben to sign out, and see you next game week for game week 29. Yeah, thanks, Jason. As always, another great podcast. Uh, Thanks, everybody, for watching, and good luck heading into game week 28. Um, You've certainly given us some food for thought, Um, and I I, I may have to enter more than one team this week based on some of those stat selections but yeah look like the video please add your comments we do read them uh, and we try to get back to as many people as possible but for now and until the next game week it's thanks a lot guys and see you soon